you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Thanks, Osram, for inviting me. Um, I'm uh, a little bit um, excited because um, I prepared, um, of course, an exact text uh, for this limited 40, 43 minutes or so we have. And this is for me quite unusual because usually uh, I speak uh, free, but this might take two hours. And so uh, I think this is a better version for you. Um, Preparing for my lecture, I have slightly modified uh, the order in which I would like to talk about the individual topics I had offered in my announcement. Variant, Variante, Variant, Osman's title for the Artistic Research Project at Sabanchi provides me with a template for this. So I would like to introduce my speech with a short reflection Irem has mentioned it already on the neologism of variantology, which I invented some 20 years uh, ago as a dynamic network of relations between art, sciences, technologies, and its constant historical changes. Or my lecture in an instant version, the world of art with and through media is consistent but it is consistent every moment anew. Only on the first side, the current global capitalism is wearing an immense variety of colorful clothes, but appearances are deceitful. Under the surface of diversity, paradigms such as unification, clustering, modularization or standardization are establishing very strongly on the global market. This process can be observed in the artistic, scientific and media practice, as well as the colligated theories and methods. Therefore, around 2004, I began to establish a worldwide research network under this strange neologism, variantology. From the perspective of different thinking traditions, the actors, the actors of the network, you recognize Bruno Latour in my formulation, the actors in the network involved, including my friends Hans Belting and Peter Weibel, whom we both unfortunately had to bury quite recently, occupy themselves with the deep time relations of the arts, sciences, and technologies. Very important for our topic today is thinking in deep time dimensions connects a possible past with a possible future. I will come back to that, but right for the beginning, I want to make this clear as well as I do not understand history as an accumulation of given facts about a past originality, but as a reality at least co-created by historians, by writers of history. For me, and I think this might be decisive for your research project here in Istanbul too. For me, the semantic field of the term variantology has a positive connotation. Be different, be alternate, vary, change are alternatives for the translation of the Latin verb variare. These terms can only be used in a negative way if a speaking subject abuses them as a method of exclusion or discrimination. The variant, the variante, the variant is also an axiomatic requirement of ecological thinking. To vary something existing is an alternative to destruction, which is not just an issue in economy, but also in various artistic avant-gardes, especially of the 20th century. And of course, it includes a strong media concept. The varieté 
experimented with the combination of various stage concepts into a fluorescing and colorful entirety long before the cinema, which could only unfold or enfold its strength at the same time of the performance in real time, so to speak. The concept of variantology contains a paradox which we encounter in other coinages, such as Georges Bataille's heterology, phenomena that are diametrically opposed, that rub each other up the wrong way, were there its friction between them or even mutual repulsion, congregate beneath a provisional roof in such a manner that at any time they are able to drift apart again and operate autonomously again. This is very important for my concept. You can always go back to autonomy again. But in contrast to the heterogeneous with its ponderous oscillations in ontology, I am interested in the variant, both methodologically and epistemologically, as a mode characterized by lightness and ease. As such, the variant is equally at home in experimental science and various artistic and media praxis, especially in music. Variations Variations on or different interpretations of an initial theme are integral to the vocabulary and everyday practice of composers and musicians. In a specific usage, the term variant means sudden changes from major to minor and vice versa by changing the intervals that is the diminution or augmentation of the third. To sum up an important and very complex aspect of the quite um, deep research project on the relations of art sciences and technologies, which I call variantology. The vertical re-exploration of history and the involving of other than the familiar academic territories are linked to a remarkable geographical reorientation. This is politically extremely important from my point of view. With the intervention of the modern age, the European culture declared itself as the hub of the world. The opinions and reviews about arts, about sciences and techniques were made between Paris, London, Stockholm, Berlin, or Petersburg. These were the places where people decided whether something was retrogressive, primitive or innovative, complex or sophisticated, an original idea or just a copy. A core thesis of my research is, I have to sum that up very strongly, the philosophical and practical elements, which are the foundations of the modern technical communicational world, originate in the Far East, especially in the ancient high cultures of China, in India, as well as in North Africa. Asia Minor, Greece, the Arabic countries, and their outposts in Southern and Southwestern Europe. I just wanted to show you these uh, two uh, titles of uh, two volumes. Uh, volume number four, number five are made in the series uh, of Variantology. Uh, this one, number four, as you can see, was focusing uh, on deep time relations of art, sciences, and technologies in the Arabic Islamic world and beyond. Uh, the uh, design uh, was done by uh, artist Iri Batsri, a Palestinian Israeli uh, artist. Uh, 
of course, we choose her uh, by conscious. Um, and this is about Ibn al Haytam uh, and many, many other beautiful uh, thinkers uh, and artists uh, from the deep time history. Um, another example was the fifth volume, uh, which we uh, developed in Napoli, in Naples, in Italy, in South Italy. Um, and uh, the focus of this volume uh, was the South, mainly the European South, but in a broader sense, thinking the South, the Vesuvian thinking and so on. Uh, so with these volumes, we were strongly trying to get out of this quite established and very conservative European uh, orientation, uh, which you are so uh, familiar with uh, from the last uh, decades uh, or even uh, centuries. Um, I firmly believe, and this is also a kind of a resume, I firmly believe that Oriental cultures in the broadest sense have a much deeper understanding of the idea of variation of variante in relation to works of art and their originality. Recently, a Japanese parent screen, paravent screen, as you can see it here on the slide, um, was uh, under reconstruction at the Museum für Völkerkunde in Leipzig. They prepared it for an exhibition or a re-exhibition. That was very, very interesting for me. The concepts concerning restoration clashed in a very strong way. While the Japanese restorers focus on the perfect functionality of the artifact, the paravent, which even implies its reinvention or rebuilding, the German restorers prioritized unconditional originality, unconditional originality. The idea of permanent change is deeply ingrained in the natural philosophy of the southeastern hemisphere. Just think about uh, the important book of change uh, in uh, deep time of Chinese uh, culture. But this is my second part. What is the state of the arts in the special fields generated with or through media, which we still call media art because we don't have a better term for it yet? On which foreground are we debating the questions of documentation, of restoration, repair, or reenactment of artifacts in this specific art context of media art? We may discuss these questions mainly with reference to the radically changing works of art exhibited and sometimes collected in the museums, like, for example, Timo Kahlen's interactive film and sound pieces from the last two decades. These are pieces of internet art. The artist himself has now prepared them for a permanent presence on ZKM's website. The performance varies dependently from the activity of the visitor as a user. You can go into the website and then you can play with it. It changes permanently. It depends what you as the user uh, is doing. Or take another example, the Somaras and Mignonors living systems. You will be very familiar with them from other discussions. Artworks between the bio and the technological, which are changing their performances permanently. Means there is nothing like originality inside such a piece apart from the specific form of programming. But as far as I know the program for your project at Sabanchi, those aspects of media art will be discussed by other experts and have been discussed by other experts already in the series of talks. Let me please reflect the topic of the variant in a slightly broader and interdiscursive way. Interdiscursive, that's important for my work. I hope 
these short thought provocations from a media archaeologist are not displaced in the context of your project. I start with a question. What do we talk about in terms of exciting encounters which art, given that we are meanwhile even dealing with more or less, more or less intelligent machines as museum visitors. What do we talk about in terms of exciting encounters with art, given that we are meanwhile even dealing with more or less intelligent machines as museum visitors? A very irritating questions perhaps, but I try to circle around it. And uh, of course, um, it puts uh, the question uh, after restoration, repair, documentation in a completely different context. Man and machine, declared the heretical philosopher and professional healer, Julian Alfred de la Maitrie, uh, in his famous work, L'Homme Machine, from the mid 18th century. It was the hate of the Enlightenment, long before machines had taken on human character, humans were beginning to become machine-like. This is an important starting point for my thought provocations. Long before machines had taken on human character, humans were beginning to become machine-like. Lametri's unabashed treatise was particularly aimed against René Descartes, the father of French philosophy, and his followers who had declared that humans were the only living beings that possessed a soul and accordingly, and accordingly also a conscience or Bewusstsein, as we say in German. La Métrie materialized this final refuge of immateriality, closing the cycle of the intelligent availability of material. A kind of circular conclusiveness long before the invention of cybernetics. During the 20th century, this is all familiar to you, I just remind you to make you um, understand my argument a little bit better. During the 20th century, the arts were radically transformed. The Italian and Russian futurists envisaged uh, a reality that was completely pervaded by machines. In this period, images acquired an amplified existence through chronophotography and cinema. The Kinokis around Gigaverto, for example, preferred microphones to ears and camera lenses to eyes. They considered the technological organs of perception much more effective than natural ones. And they dreamed of an artificial brain that would control the shooting of their films, an electric brain, of course. In Marcel Duchamp's large glass, both the lower part with a bachelor machine featuring the chocolate grinder in the center and the upper part with the bride's domain are composed of imaginary animated machines, artifacts. In the art of the second half of the 20th century, games with artificial beings, with dolls, with monikers, with technical surrogates and masquerades have become a subgenre of the investigation of living artificiality and the delicate mechanics of life. From Hans Bellmer's famous mechanical doll to the object of desire in the films of the Quay brothers, for example, or of Namjoon Pike's first trashy robots from the early 1960s. Roberta Brightmore, some of you might know her, Lynn Hirschman's Leeson's, Lynn Hirschman Leeson's invention of a sort of a doppelganger from the 1970s, an autonomous personality who was completely staged anticipates the avatars that were developed at the end of the 20th century in the arts. 
Following the existential catastrophes of Auschwitz and Hiroshima, technology no longer merely influences our existence. Instead, it is the unconditional belief in a possible future in which the most complex challenges composed, composed by nature, economics, culture, and art can be solved by learning machines and programs. In this sense, our existence has now become decisively technological. It's not influenced by technology. This is not enough. It has become decisive technological, unconditioned technological. Learning algorithms generate image and sound artifacts that no longer need a reference in the real. Artists like Lynn Hirschman, whom I have shown before, or Hito Steyerl, my colleague uh, from my old university at the University of Arts, have experimented with this in their projects on pattern recognition in photography, or just take uh, the quite brutal example of Eva and Franco Mattes, better known as Zero One dot org uh, from Italy with one of their provoking projects recently shown in Milano, the half cat. In the 21st century, the art world is undergoing its next far more radical transformation. What was reserved for a large trade fairs, for large trade fairs devoted to advanced technology is now taking place in galleries and in museums. The museums and their collections are visited by more or less intelligent artifacts. The artificiality of paintings and sculptures is increasingly joined by hybrid techno biological or entirely technical beings. Tentatively still, sporadically, but the options for future presences are clearly emerging. Here we are, they say these artifacts. They say more and more confidently. We belong to a new family, to the phylum of artificial existences with intellect, with feelings and even erotic appeal. Machine controlled, clocked by the standard time of the worldwide internet, outwardly quite similar to the monikers, the most even living sculptures with angelic alabaster skin. I will show you an example soon. Those artifacts are not just objects for us to look at. Their eyes are adamantly set on the human visitors, winking, seeking dialogue, talk with me, with the other artistic artifacts. The traditional works of art, which are in principle carved from the same material as they are. Graceful and seductive, testing, relentlessly judging. We are here differently now, these artifacts are saying. No longer in the role of objects that you humans can use at will, but as subjects that demand attention and respect. The frivolous beings, as I call them, the frivolous, frivole wesen, frivolous beings who appear as visitors in exhibitions are the result of a perception of art by machine learning processes. They do not differ in their degrees of intelligence, but in the gesture with which they are respectively in the world as technical individuals. Let's take the example of the Kunsthalle in Baden-Baden, where not only expensive contemporary paintings, but also artificial viewers have been invited recently by curator Udo Kittelmanns for an exhibition. 
John Wolfson's bizarre female figure is a spawn of information capitalist consciousness industry, it seems, extremely narcissistic, constantly seducing herself or herself as an image, which is a better formulation, as if stolen from a pornographic shop, fulfilling all the cliches of women as sexual objects, loud, burlesque, diabolical, with an identity somewhere between a trashed Madonna, a cyberpunk, and a fit survival figure of the second half of the 21st century. Attractive and repulsive, evoking affection and disgust and doubts, considerable doubts about the meaningfulness of what we call culture or even art. Perhaps the character is even more of a stranger than Ryan Gander's clever mouse. It stems from the coming time when humans, technology, plants and animals finally form an equal ensemble that plays the planet Earth in disharmonious concordance. But the clever animal, the mouse, is still skeptical, as you can see. Only briefly does it peek out from its hiding place behind the museum wall, observing the human visitors, as well as the hanging pictures and standing sculptures, and immediately disappears again. She doesn't want to be more than a short-term temporary guest in the museum. Quite in contrast to Luisa Clement's artificial doppelganger in the public, at the same time, so intimate interior of the art museum. Casual, smoothly, beautiful, hygienically clean, adaptable, disposable, disciplined, alternating between interested and disinterested, alienated, she seems made for an art exhibition in a German museum. She speaks little English, the Esperanto of the telematically determined age. The physical features that promise erotic experience are somewhat over accentuated, suggesting the identity of an art prostitute. The museum as a virtual brothel. The lonelier and older the visitors and collectors become, the more they want to surround themselves with pretty bachelorettes, whether they are flesh and blood, silicone, or simply painted surface. What all artifacts which I have just shown as examples have in common is their unconditionality, their ruthlessness. They know no mercy, no compassion. They obey orders, algorithms, of course. They execute, they are compelling in their limitless purposeful existence, they irritate at the same time those human visitors who have already shifted their own existence far into the machine, who have forgotten how to be offline or no longer consider it possible. And not much has changed in this respect since Fritz Lang's Metropolis, the frivolous technical beings, the Marias of the now, are usually female. I come to my third part. Let's come back to the wonderful world of manifoldness which the variant is offering. The unspoken counterpart to the variant in the art debate, of course, is the original. My thesis is the originality of a work of art in the age of its infinite reproducibility and perceivability is a chimera. The originality is a chimera and a phantasm to which the global art market clinches because 
it wants to protect itself from becoming superfluous. Painting as a work of art survived the first transformation in the age of technical reproduction, viewed suspiciously as an entity that was pampered and poured by art historians and the art market. It will only experience the recent transformations as an observer, as marginalia, sending its greetings from the archives and the containers of the collections in the museums. In the future, only the perfect copies of the most valuable works of art history will be shown. That is, their avatars, their digital clones, or their representatives. There we are again in representation, which we thought we had lost as a paradigm. In this way, like-minded beings will encounter one another in the museum. We don't need to lament this. It is the price that Homo sapiens have to pay for their claim to power over nature that has been developed over the millennia. The possibility of connecting with Homo ludens, which might have saved the human race, has been missed. Instead, humans have decided in favor of Homo artefactus, uh, as Joseph Chapek sketched out nearly a century ago for the Czech avant-garde in his book on artificial humans from 1924, Homo artefactus. Humans have destroyed the place through which they could develop into subjects. This play simultaneously provided a home to their images. In the future, these images will be homeless, like the subjects that produce them and communicate with them. The radical consequence of the complete opening of access to a large part of the approximately 55,000 museums worldwide uh, on interactive digital platforms will be that the museums will make themselves superfluous in their classic functions, not completely, but in their classic functions, as far as the protection of the original artifacts is concerned. In the digital presence, they are exposed to almost arbitrary deformation and exploitation, which is the same thing. Just two of the most recent examples from Berlin are a gigantic immersive walk installation of Gustav Klimt's famous painting, The Kiss, which really makes me sick, or the merciless exploitation, which even makes me more, sit, more sick, sorry, uh, the merciless exploitation of the appeal of Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring. Just as necessary as a stronger commitment in technical terms, we need an ethical discussion in the debate about how to deal with the infinity of clones of the real in the internet. Unfortunately, there is no sense of dignity, no sense of dignity in the digital world. I would like to repeat, works of art are subjects and not arbitrarily changeable objects. And we should treat them with the same kind of respect and extraordinary sensitivity, which we have for other subjects. My fourth part, and I'm slowly approaching the end. In other words, future becomes a space of possibility a potential space, as the British psychoanalysist and child psychiatrist Donald Winnicott calls that time space in which the playful appropriation of coming realities take place in young children. Play with alternative options for shaping both the time behind us and the time ahead is the inner core 
of all developed media appear apparatuses dealing with processes and movements with natural as well as artificial life. In order to provide a rich future of media activity, we must grant the objects of our research desire a past that is at least as rich and diverse as the future. Methodologically, I go one step further. The coveted diversity and heterogeneity in the direction of that arrow of time that points toward that points forward is to be logically coupled with the confusing multiplicities of past and buried presences. The archaeology of media and the arts, as I am passionate uh, about, is at its core a particular play with potentialities that includes variation as an essential dimension. Just as I do not accept that futures are technologically inevitably pre-programmed, I cannot agree with the attitude of historians or physicists who view history or material reality as merely an accumulation of given series of facts to be traversed linearly. For me, Working and living in the space-time machine of my research means being able to travel constantly to different cultures, to different historical constellations with preference to forgotten or repressed regions and periods. In the, com in the comfort of such a time machine, we can continue to focus on the most important thing which is to keep dreaming forward, dreaming forward through the exploration of the past presences. Let me conclude with some remarks, revisiting my last lecture at Sabanchi Museum in Istanbul before the pandemic, before COVID, which seems to be centuries ago. The lecture was dedicated to my concept of prospective archaeology as a theoretical and practical tool for reactivating the past, which needs precise documentation as a precondition. Especially in those cases of artifacts where there never has been an original and these are the ones which are interesting me most. There never has been an original, but there has been a precise description of what the origin, the original artifact could have been. Prospective archaeology sees itself foremost as a pleasurable activity in the here and in the now, just like the variant in your project. The seemingly paradoxical abstract mixtum compositum, prospective archaeology, that is uh, constructed by this term, consists in essence of a practice that operates in accordance with two opposing arrows of time. You can see it here in this diagram and this sketch, which I shape and reshape uh, again and again. One of these arrows is oriented vertically into the deep time of cultures that still remains to be explored. And that for me is forever remade by virtue of interdependencies in the relationships among the arts, sciences and technologies. The other arrow points from the now into an enduringly and unremittingly opaque future, where the utopian potential of media archaeological activity and its associated artistic practices resides is in the possibility of bringing these two arrows of time into relation with one another, such that the passengers inside this particular time machine are not torn apart 
in the process. This would be dangerous, of course. To keep on seeking and finding in the old only the locus of multiplicities and particularities which are no longer accessible because no longer existing is boring and inevitably leads to a profound melancholy. But to learn and intellectually profit from the heterogeneity and wealth of relations in past constellations for the sake of future presence is an alluring challenge. Only in this way, we can, our experimental time machine can become a generator of surprises. Only in this way can our experimental time machine become a generator of surprises. Prospective archaeology is challenging, even the concept of the variant and at the same time, it is coexisting with it. Sometimes we are constructing artifacts which had been described in the past, but we do not know if they even existed beyond their original description and their original manuals. One of my favorite objects of prospective archaeology is the elephant clock. Uh, it's also perhaps the best known um, example. The elephant clock of the engineer Al Jazari from the Diyarbakir, from the Diyarbakir region of northern Mesopotamia, now of course part of Turkey. This stately artifact may have existed, but certainly not in the numerous variants that exist now in science and technology museums of the Arabic Islamic tradition, or even in shopping malls like in Dubai. The variant, this is the Dubai version, and uh, this is the uh, cultural historical uh, analysis uh, of the object. I have no time uh, to go uh, inside of that. Um, the variant, uh, I had uh, built for our exhibition, Alas Automata, uh, artifacts of the Arabic Islamic Renaissance between 800 and 1200 at the ZKM Karlsruhe, together with Peter Weibel, uh, was done or was made in Bursa in Anatolia. And this was something very special. Uh, it was made in collaboration with the Science Technology Museum in Bursa, whose director, responded to my request with a beautiful phrase, science is for everyone. We built this for you. This was in the year 2015. I'm not sure uh, if it would be so easy uh, today. I'm convinced that once we get to the point in the arts that we can say art is for everyone. Here's a version of the artwork that you can look at and use in the best possible quality that we can provide, then we won't need the classic museum anymore. It will have become something else that we can't name today. Perhaps an open access, luxurious guest house for practicing unconditioned hospitality and dignity, which also would be a wonderful thing. Let me conclude with a few lines of a short techno-philosophical thought. Since there can be no perfection in nature, there is no perfection in technology either, and certainly not in the arts. All we find are attempts at approaching as nearly as possible the highest precision, the most perfect beauty. The ubiquitous imperfection of artificiality created things thus leads me, in conclusion, to define more precisely what the generators of surprise in a prospective archaeology would be aiming for methodologically in the future. I am pleading the case for the most exact possible variant, not of perfect, but of precise and likewise beautiful things contrived and developed for the sake of supporting 
enabling and transforming dialogue with others and with the other into a sensational and consistently spectacular, even scandalous occasion. Thanks a lot for your patient. Uh, I think I was in time, uh, more or less. Um, and now uh, feel free to comment uh, or to ask questions. This is another wonderful piece uh, of prospective archaeology. No time to uh, present it now. We developed that further, but I had presented it last time when I was at Zabanchi five years ago or so. Uh, so this is not uh, such a great loss. It's the great musical automaton from 850 constructed by the Banu Musa from Baghdad. <laughs>